All right, thank you for coming um, to hear our panel on uh, open systems firmware. Um, we're, we're not kidding that we are passionate trailblazers in this area. Um, our passion comes because we are all concerned about the security of systems all the way from the bottom level device, the first time that you, the electrons hit a device in a system, all the way up through the firmware, the hypervisors, the devices, the operating system. So in order to do that, we are, um, we are here from, we represent competitive companies who are working together. And we realize that the security of a system is only as strong as its weakest link. And there are no systems today, none, in which the components are all built and controlled by one company. So for that reason, we all work together. And we are presenting today at three, at least three, um, different efforts that are trying to open up and make secure and more resilient the world of firmware. Um, our experience covers the whole stack. Um, collectively, we've covered everything from smart cards to servers, the whole, the whole bit. Yep. So um, our full biographies are in the conference program if you want to learn more about us. But um, the format of our session today is to, we'll introduce the, I'll introduce the panel members. Um, that'll, um, then each speaker will describe briefly an effort that uh, he's, he's working in. Um, we'll have plenty of time, I think, for questions and discussion, which is why we have this as a panel. And if you all don't come up with questions, I will, and they are going to worry because some of those are pretty hard. <laughs> so I personally work at IBM's uh, Thomas J. Watson Research Center in the Secure Cloud and Systems Group. Um, most recently, I worked on our Power and System Z servers for a secure boot. Um, I, the reason I organized this panel was that I'm hoping that out there in the audience or some of your friends and colleagues, um, we might hit other passionate individuals who are also worried about these things and you might want to join in our activities. So the speakers, I guess you'll have to raise your hands. The first speaker is going to be Ron Minnick. He's a software engineer from Platform Security and Google. Um, Ron's the inventor of Linux BIOS. It's also known as Core Boot. He's a member of the Technical Ske Steering Committee for Linux Boot, as well as co-leader of the Open Systems Firmware Project at the Open Compute Project. The next speaker will be Nate Klein. He's from Google. He's co-chair of the Open Compute Project uh, Security Project. Uh, he's a hardware engineer on the platform's infrastructure team that designs and deploys all of the hardware that powers Google's internal and cloud servers. So Nate's going to tell us about OCP, the security project. And third is Brian Kelly <laughs> from Microsoft. He's also the co-chair of the Open Compute Project on security. He is the principal firmware engineering manager for Microsoft's Azure cloud server infrastructure team. His team designs and develops firmware that enables hardware solutions in Microsoft's next generation cloud platforms. And Brian will be talking about EDK2. So all three of these are open system firmware projects and we'll go on now to Ron. Oh, you're right. I don't need this mic. You? Yeah. That is it. All right. And then we go to present. present. Yep. God. Is that it? You want to speak your notes, too? No, I'm good. I'm always a little shocked when we do something like this and it works. Um, so this is a project we started at Google in January 2017. It's uh, Linux boot. Linux is firmware, um, and we decided in March of 2017 that we really needed to open this up to more to external participants, um, in part to convince the 
chips head and board vendors that it wasn't just Google because the first thing you ever get from a lot of these companies when you come in with new firmware ideas, you're the only people asking for this. So uh, by May, we, we brought in Horizon Computing with John Reaver Dunn. They buy today Facebook servers and resell them with Linux boot um, in them already. Um, then we have also gotten Trammell Hudson. You may know him from Thunderstrike. He's doing some really awesome work in a system called Heads. Um, let's see, are you here, Todd? Okay, so go see Todd Weaver and see the neat stuff that he's doing with Heads, if you get a chance. Uh, and then, of course, we have Facebook and Nine Elements and other people at Google. And here, in a nutshell, is the problem. Um, I kind of been saying this for 20 years. I'm surprised I'm still putting this slide up. But basically, if you don't own the firmware, the firmware owns you. That's just the way it works today. Now, back in the day when I began this kind of thing, we wanted to own first in instruction after power on reset. We've kind of accepted that um, that's not going to happen in the x86 world ever again. We used to do it. We don't do it anymore. Actually accepting that, accepting that the box in the lower left is going to be kind of owned by vendors from here on out is OK. That's what turns on DRAM, nasty things like that. It's 10% of the image and firmware. And what we're saying is, well, yeah, but we want to own that stuff off to the right. And by the way, this is my nice shirt with a nice biohazard sticker. If you see one of the park, Chris Cock over there, he can give you the stickers if you want to put on your uh, laptop. We all have it now. Uh, but basically, if you look at that set of drivers there, there's several hundred drivers of various unknown origin in a typical server or in a typical laptop today. And that number sounded ridiculous to me until Trammell demonstrated it. And what happens is you start, you go into this intrinsic box, which is just a quick call out to this thing called a dispatcher. And the dispatcher runs the init instruction in function in every one of the drivers in there. And then it'll often run the drivers more than once, because if any one driver depends on some other driver, it just runs the driver over and over again. No matter how many times that driver's been run, if some other thing is discovered that depends on the driver, the drivers all get run again. Um, then we go into a thing called the boot manager, which runs a bunch more stuff. And then eventually on a lot of your systems, probably is going to run Grub. But the boot manager all might, also might do a fun little thing for you, which is install a thing called the OS Present app. The OS Present app is an app that runs along with your OS and shares the machine with you. And a lot of people don't even know that. So all the great work that's been done on Linux and SD Linux and all these things over the years doesn't actually really matter because there's this thing called the OS Present app running. So this is a slightly scary situation. I used to give this talk to various people from the Department of Homeland Security and things like that. And the first time I mentioned this in around 2000, the response was, yeah, but we're not going to talk about that anymore from the US government. And then about 2007, it got to, god, that's depressing. Let's not talk about that. But you know, And nowadays, I can kind of go in and say, yeah, but I can offer you a little bit of hope. Um, and a little bit of hope is this picture. And this is what we are doing today. Um, and that includes all the participants I mentioned on platforms we can talk about and platforms we're not ready to talk about yet. But the OS present app is gone. Many of the drivers are gone. And Trammell literally has reduced on one platform 400 drivers down to 80. 80 is 80 too many, but it's a start. Um, and we put Linux in Flash. We, we don't have Grub anymore because Linux in Flash runs. And Linux in Flash does a k-exec for whatever thing we're loading. Now, that Linux in Flash includes an init RAM FS. And I'll talk about that more in a second. But look at all the stuff that's gone. You know, it's not all the stuff we want gone. This is what we really want. There is a proprietary blob. And I'll mention again, you're not going to get anything but that on an x86. You're not going to get that anything but that on an ARM. There's always going to be this thing that's native machine code that runs that you can't get rid of. I, you know, I find that regrettable as, as actually someone who's been writing these BIOS things for 40 years. But that's just the way life is. We will have Linux and Flash. And then the init RAM FS is a different project called Uroot. Um, and Uroot is everything written in Go. So if you think of just take the GNU bin and don't use the GNU bin, but have a thing that is that equivalent and all the code is in Go. And our security people love that at, at Google. You know, If you give them Go code, they're willing to audit it. And if you give them C code, they generally are not. So 90% of, of what's in Flash is now Linux and an init RAM FS. And then we start um, a system, we boot, 
and there's nothing left. There's no OS present app, right? Everything is gone when you're running. You own the platform. And that's not the situation as it is today on most of the system, systems you run. Why do you need it? We want control at the BIOS level. We want things like security and performance and security and control and security and ease of use and security and security and security, right? I start to sound like the spam script from Monty Python, but you know, we're trying to get security. And if you really just start Googling UEFI security issues and CVEs, it's a never ending list. Um, I've learned because of Trammell Hudson again about some really terrific ones that are gonna come out this fall that'll kind of make your teeth hurt once you read them. Um, and this is the scary one. Because UEFI is supposed to update itself, right? You need a new UEFI. This is why all of you own Macs. Sometimes you do an update and it says, make sure it's powered in, don't touch it, it's gonna go away for a while, it'll be okay. Okay, that's the part where UEFI is updating itself frequently. Well, what that kind of implies is that it would be possible to have an exploit that would embed itself in UEFI and break the UEFI updates itself part and make it look like UEFI updated itself successfully. Now you're done, right? And your only option at that point is called a chipper, right? You can remove that exploit with a chipper. You don't have a useful machine left at the end, but at least the exploit's gone. So. <laughs> So we've got these hundreds of binary blobs. Now what's the last thing that gets done on a new, a new machine? The firmware. The machine's late. Firmware's done in a rush. Is the firmware really all that good? Generally not. And, and you've got hundreds of other things. But we're, we're actually making it a lot easier. So as an example system, if you have a Dell R630, you can git clone a tree. If you're interested, come and talk to me about it. I don't have time for the how-to. And in three minutes, you've got a BIOS image. Now, that generally takes about an hour to do a build with UEFI today for that thing. So three minutes is not half bad. There are 15 machines now that are public and on the website we can point you to. Um, and there are more machines all the time. And then the machines we can't talk about. You can today buy off-the-shelf OCP systems. These are recycled systems from Facebook. They're refurb and being resold. They're actually a pretty good deal from IT Renew, and they come with Linux boot pre-installed. So what we really do, we take the ROM, we scrape away 90% of it and replace it with Linux. That's the short form. If I'm running, am I okay? I'm good on time. Okay, Elaine asked me our legal framework. Obviously, you know, Linux is GPL. Uroot, for a lot of reasons, just kind of a Go community convention uh, is VSD. Coreboot, because I first started demonstrating on this in Coreboot in 2014, is GPL and some BSD, things like microcode. Uh, power firmware, because we've made this work on power, we replaced Pettit boot with the Uroot stuff. Uh, so there, that's uh, Apache 2, I think is still Apache 2, and Uroot is GPL 2. We've also done this kind of approach on uh, ARMs and things like that. But the general rule is it's basically probably gonna be GPL if you ask that question. Uh, we really need help. We can always use help. We need help at the kernel level. We need help at the writing Go code level. Uh, you can go to linuxboot.org. You can look at uroot.tk. We have a Slack channel, slack.uroot.com. Uh, OpenQPoot platform, that, that, uh, um, you know, that, that initiative is there. We're always very happy to have people come in, especially people who make systems and people who make chips. You know, we have a lot of users. We have Facebook and we have nine elements and we have Google on the Open Compute platform call. What we don't have enough of, in my view today, is the guys who, you know, companies that write design boards and design chipsets. We're working to bring them in too. And if you want a fun sticker, uh, come and get one after the talk, or there's bioshazard.info. Um, and, you know, I think computer people look at that and generally tend to read bioshazard. We didn't leave enough of a space, so a lot of people who look at it say, what's a bioshazard? So sorry about that. <laughs> We're going to have version two of that sticker soon. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know if this is working right. No, nope. it didn't do. Still not yet. Should we just do presenter view? How am I not presenting? Uh, I don't know. Uh, can you just maximize it? Put your window in full screen mode. There we go. Oh, there you go. Oh, you have to back up where you are. All right. Uh, 
All right. My name is Nate. I'm here to talk about the OCP security project that Brian and I are co-leads for. Um, and firmware security, it turns out, is a thing. Uh, as Ron said, it's not great right now, but this will hopefully help. Uh, so currently, the state of things is a really sad balloon. Uh, <laughs> the secure boot is, in general, is very fragmented at best. Every chip vendor has their own different solution. So if you want something that you know secure boots universally, you don't have it. Um, and there are also these proprietary black boxes that Ron mentioned uh, that you probably want to make sure that magical black box is the correct magical black box and isn't just some random thing that you're blindly trusting. Uh, and unfortunately, as was mentioned in the uh, IoT presentation, uh, the lowest common denominator is no security at all. And uh, I usually like to say the uh, S in IoT stands for security. <laughs> so the, the goals of our project uh, are to improve security across like, the entire computing industry through open standards. We want to make security um, a base requirement for anything, not a differentiator. Um, uh, and that also reduces a lot of redundant effort. Um, and you know, building your own security snowflake is generally not going to go well. Uh, security is significantly better and more secure when it's open. There are lots of eyes looking at it. Um, and so what we want to produce are some specifications for both hardware and software security implementations. Um, we want to work across all different kinds of uh, IT equipment. OCP likes to use IT equipment for basically anything that runs code. Um, and uh, we want to use like existing and emerging standards as much as we can and not have to you know, reinvent the wheel when we don't have to. So the focal points are basically taking every single piece of firmware or uh, storage that's on any kind of board and securing it. So we want to be able to provision firmware as well. So that includes you know, secure updates and rollbacks, um, recover um, from a bad state successfully so that you're never turned into a brick by going into a bad state. Um, and then the ever so terrifying attestation. <laughs> uh, so making sure that you know, you're running on the correct thing. Um, so we also like to standardize interfaces. We want to uh, standardize both hardware, uh, like hardware electrical interfaces and software APIs. Um, and then uh, very importantly, we want to support change of ownership. So used gear should also be secure. Uh, something like you know a key burned into one-time fuses is great for the first person who owns something. It's kind of useless for the next person unless you want to hand off your private keys to someone else, which you probably don't. Um, so the scope of the project, uh, sort of physical security countermeasures, or sorry, what's out of scope, is physical security countermeasures. Uh, so like disabling JTAG interfaces or things like that would be in scope. Um, someone hitting your server with a screwdriver is not really going to be our problem. And we're also not going to play with thermite, unfortunately. Tried to sneak that one in. They wouldn't, wouldn't let me. Um, we're also not looking at like, coding practices or, uh, or like, compiler time you know, checks or things like that. Um, also not really focusing on penetration testing of hardware or software. Um, and we do not want to invent new encryption algorithms. Uh, we'd like to rely on you know, existing or currently like in the works, very well proven technology for that. Um, so we are making progress uh, in here. There are links to a couple of uh, docs that we've been working on as a group. Uh, we sort of started out as our group by looking at all the common security threats that we want to be able to tackle and trying to categorize them and figure out like how we're going to tackle them. Uh, and then we've started drafts of sort of two of our subsections out of about six, I think. 
Uh, so we have a secure boot section and an attestation section that are both definitely uh, still works in progress. Um, and you should join us. Uh, we are uh, an incubation stage OCP project. Um, and we'll hopefully be transitioning into a full OCP project. Uh, there's a mailing list. There are weekly meetings that are the most exciting thing ever. <laughs> uh, yeah, they are very early in the morning if you're on the West Coast, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Nate. Hi, so my name is, uh, is not Gondrala de Vindergout, and I didn't plagiarize these slides. These are uh, his slides. Um, he couldn't make it today, so I'm standing in uh, for him. I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to talk on this uh, topic. But uh, de Vinder, as he goes by, is a co-lead with Ron in the uh, open, uh, open source firmware group in, in open compute. Open Compute, if you haven't heard about it, uh, tries to do what, what's been done in, in software in that it tries to take hardware and make a hardware platform open just like any open source uh, software project. Obviously, there's differences with you know, the types of collateral that are, that are made open, but a part that has a lot of com commonality would be the, the firmware because it's all software underneath the hood. So um, this, this slide talks a little bit about the mission um, for, for the group. And their, their goal is to, to make the firmware uh, as open as possible and provide more choice, just like all open source software. It's about providing transparency. Um, and through transparency, you're going to get security. And it's also about providing choice. So. Uh, Ron had already covered a, a lot of this in, in, in his talk about the companies that are contributing to the, o, to the open source uh, firmware development. Uh, Intel, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, Lenovo, uh, Horizon, and, and others. Uh, the work streams inside in this, uh, in this committee or project are uh, open EDK2, uh, Linux boot, core boot, uh, then there's the, the silicon providers also providing uh, their pieces of the, the platform initialization. Um, and that's the 10% the uh, Ron talked about as always been, always been there just to do that platform initialization. Okay, so uh, th this part talks a little bit about one of the efforts inside that project that uh, Devinder drives. And that is the uh, Open EDK uh, Dixie Core Workstream. The goals of the Workstream, of course, are uh, taking the uh, EDK2 uh, code base and uh, making that open source, supporting you know firmware security features like secure boot, measured boot, uh, uh, multiple OS boot, uh, supporting uh, new hardware security. Uh, modules like Cerberus and, and others uh, supporting uh, out-of-band configuration, making sure that the deployment of that, f that firmware is easy to set up, and also optimizing it for performance, uh, reliability, serviceability, and uh, deploying at scale. Uh, of course, there's an initial project uh, that's been open sourced, and the link is provided below. takes us to the end. Right. Oh, at the end of the presentation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brian. Okay. okay. So we're going to do Q&A, right? Yeah, so now we'll do Q&A. So who wants to be the first one to come to queue? It's, it's, 
It's very it's carefully designed to be impossible yeah. to find. Yeah. Security by obscurity. Exactly. There. Okay. So you've been working on this for a while. Why isn't it done yet? <laughs> we need more contributors like you to help us take it there. Great question. Thanks, right. Casey. <laughs> Hi, guys. I work on OpenBMC and Open Power Firmware at IBM. How do you see the work we do on things like OpenBMC interfacing with your uh, work group? And, and what, what's it going to look like when the rubber hits the road? You know? uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I'll maybe take, take that one first. So. Um, we're also collaborators in OpenVMC, so um, uh, uh, yeah, and actually have deployed instances productized of OpenVMC, and one of the only companies to do that to date um, is to deploy that at scale. So um, in OpenVMC and having the, the Open EDK, we're obviously this communication that goes between uh, the bootloader and the the BMC uh, for platform exchanging platform configuration data. Sometimes there's some there's some error information that goes into the BMC about hardware errors. All of those interfaces and plumbing uh, we've put in place inside in the Open EDK. So. This. So you see yourselves as defining the APIs between the host firmware and the, the management firmware, or, or? Um, there there are APIs there are APIs defined there already. Um, I don't think we're d d defining all of those interactions that need that need to happen, but we have put some in place already. Okay. Um, and it's based on on IPMI. So there's like IPMI exchanges during during boot. Uh, to pass information about the system platform into the uh, into the VMC. Okay, so you want to create open standards for doing this between open firmware that's running on the host and open firmware that's running on the BMC. Is that the goal of your your group? Uh, that's not the goal. That's not the the primary goal of the group. But it's what definitely one of the things that is discussed in there is what you know what information should be exchanged and what is the payload format that should be exchanged. Um, cool. and we'd encourage more people from open VMC to attend. Yeah, I was just wondering like, if I rock up for the meetings, which as an Australian, they're going to be at two in the morning or something. Um, uh, I'm not sure what if I could rock up, uh, what, would, what would my project be able to bring to the table and what would you be able to help out in? Um, well, with open, with open VMC, I know they've already got some IPMI framework uh, as well as Redfish uh, framework that they're putting in place. I think the communication between um, the the bootloader and the BMC, the bandwidth uh, for that exchange isn't isn't very large. So those payloads are kind of more complementary to binary-based payloads as opposed to web-based payloads and XML. Um, but architect architecturally, that interface is is still somewhat in its in its infancy, and physically. The interfaces too are a little bit different as you transition architectures and away from you know maybe an an, an x86 architecture might have one interface to a BMC. When you go to to ARM and other uh, platforms, they tend to have different interfaces into the VMC. So you can definitely contribute in some of the uh, driver work there and enablement and APIs that are friendly across all platforms to make it more generic. So we welcome you to join. I'm going to quick throw in a, a slightly different angle on all that, too. Um, so IT Renew, which used to be Horizon Computing, is buying probably, I, I guess, I well, tens of thousands, let's just call it at the moment, of Facebook nodes. And um, they installed the Linux boot with the Go-based uh, init RAMFS that I mentioned. Um, they are actually going to be looking at installing that same model on the BMC. And the reason is they have got the boot time on those nodes from eight minutes spent in UEFI down to 20 seconds spent in Linux boot. And what they initially, then they immediately discovered that it's taken longer for the BMC to boot than it is for the main processor. 
And so um, what they want to look at, and they've asked us to look to help them, because the Linux kernel and the, and the Go-based sort of init RAMFS boot so fast, and we did actually put some design in there to make that boot fast on ARM, um, they would like to look at that same identical stack on the VMC that they run on the x86 because that cuts their maintenance tasks in half, right? They've got one stack, not two. And it's a considerably simpler stack uh, with the Linux kernel and the, the, the Go-based in RAMFS. So um, uh, based on that, I'm not sure, you know, what I would be, I would want to try and predict where things are going to go here. But... Um, the change in boot time on the x86 side, and I remember this a long time ago in the early 2000s, there was a company, uh, I forget their name now, uh, new, uh, anyway, uh, we put Linux BIOS on the x86 on the AMD, and uh, they had a uh, PowerPC running hard hat Linux as their quote unquote BMC. And as soon as we had uh, Linux booting in three seconds on the AMD, we observed that, you know, four minutes and, um, 57 seconds later, the BMC came up and put some text on the LCD-based front panel and said, hey, man, I'm ready to help boot your machine. Well, by that point, you know, the machines had joined the cluster. They were running computing tasks by the time the BMC was ready to join the party. So, you know, I, I've had this experience since really the 2000s of, 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 you know, throwing away the existing firmware on the x86, putting in something that boots in seconds, and then realizing that, the uh, maintenance system for the x86 is just barely hanging on, keeping up. So my, in my ideal world, I, I, I was at a really great FOSDEM one year, and a guy pointed out that the uh, hard requirement for an automotive Linux-based system to be up and ready and have turned on lights on the front panel is 800 milliseconds. And in my heart of hearts, uh, what I really think should be the right time for a BMC to be ready and active and communicating and functional, that's a good number. And we're not even close. We're about a factor of um, 40 off today because the number I'm seeing is 30 seconds. So that that's my slightly contrarian view of the BMC situation. So, attestation. Um, so, one of the fun things about all of this about attestation is it goes all the way up the stack, right? And for it to be useful, you've got to have attestation frameworks, remote attestation servers, all that sort of stuff. Um, do any of you see it as part of your brief to be interacting with those frameworks, to be looking at the sort of big server remote attestation community, blah, et cetera? What are your thoughts? Oh. I didn't. I didn't want to talk to that. Or did you want to talk to that? I can start. Good. You can take that. This may take be my mom. No, it's not my mom. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me on this thing? Yes. So um, on the attestation side, um, that's one of the things that I'm working on in the OCP security project. Um, we, we first had to define our scope and try to limit what we did because it would take, you know, how many years to do this to, in, as of the first question, right? <laughs> Um, as far as how we're planning to do it for now is that it is a hierarchical plan so that devices within the system will attest to the server itself, which may actually turn out to be the BMC in the server. Um, and then it will be up to the server to then pass that on or not to a data center. So it will be hierarchical for now. So you're yes, from the device... We, we are talking up from the device to the server, but not beyond for now. And you um, have a comment, Ron? I, I just wanted to mention one thing, because we, yeah, we're, the real expert on our, our plans is, is over here. It's Chris Cock. Come and talk to him later if you're interested. Um, Netboot is so incredibly broken in the x86 world that it's it's almost impossible to look at it and think of anything but just throwing it all away so that's what we're doing um, give you give you an interesting example um, everybody thinks pixie boot is slow and they're right but then they go from that to conclude that net booting is slow and there they're wrong net booting can be very very fast it can do it in a second or two so the the plan 
where we are is you'll you'll do a, a DH. We have a DH client written in Go, of course. We do a DH client, wget, gpgv, and then somewhere linked in all that junk in ways I don't understand because these guys understand it and I don't. Is is our attestation framework? But um, you know, as long I I I worry a lot about NetBoot. I'm a former high performance computing guy, and that's how we did everything. And um, you know. None of this has any use unless you throw away, especially things like Pixie Boot. So, um, you know, you, re you really have to scrape the stack clean down to the silicon and, and think it over again, or you're just doomed, in my view. So, any, okay. Hey guys. Uh, all right. So, between Core Boot, uh, sort of Linux as an application operating system, and OpenBMC, uh, are any of you concerned about lack of diversity? <laughs> in the stack, you know, from an attack perspective? No concerns? What? I, You're using the same kernel for everything, right? Oh. So if there's... I had, a, I had an interesting talk. Eric Gross used to be our VP of security at Google. I've known him for decades, and I had an interesting talk with him about that, the whole diversity thing, right? And he said to me he'd never actually seen a benefit um, and, and I've heard this discussion from security people a couple of times now. If you talk about saying, well, you're depending on Linux and firmware, and now you're depending on Linux after you boot, they've never seen a case that diversity would make that situation better. They make, make it a lot worse. Yeah, we've seen it make it worse. Hmm? Fix one button, not three. Yes, yeah. It, it pays to fix, that's, that's the perfect, Brian just said it. Fix one bug, not three. Yeah. So, so it helps you to focus um, a lot of your resources onto one thing as opposed to putting people on focused on many different things uh, to try and catch exploits and bugs uh, across different varieties of kernels. Uh, if you can focus on that one and mature it, then you're in a stronger place. Um, I don't know if you've noticed also um, from a, an industry point of view, uh, the lack of security developers at all levels. I mean, you can see <laughs> how many of us are in this room, right? And we found, at least working in OCP, um, that there are many vendors who admit openly that they don't know security and they are relying on us to come up with the standards because they just don't know it and they don't have the staff. Nobody cares about security in the end, right? I mean, so, so here's the other comment. So I had a friend once, I, he worked in an architecture office, said, how come the H, heating, heating and cooling in every building I've ever been in is completely broken? And he says, they always do that in the last week. Nobody cares about it. They leave it to the end, and they just throw it in the plants with all the junior staff who have never done it before. That's why it's always broken. So... Um, that's why, you know, my joke about, look, they build, the, they build the motherboard and they ship the firmware out as the last afterthought. So if you think about what do they even care less about than the fact that boots, generally security is the thing everybody, when, when schedule pressures hit, that's the thing they throw away, which is crazy, but that's kind of what I hear over and over again. So that's always a problem. In the end, nobody cares about security, even though they say they care about security. Could, could I respond to the heterogeneity question? Heterogeneity is, I think, as Elaine was saying, is good if you have, if you don't have scarcity of your resources. If you have scarcity of resources, I think trying to apply those resources to a small number of things and try and get them as good as possible, rather than having a large number of things which are all terrible, is, is probably better. I mean, I absolutely agree, but it's we do have scarcity. I think that's probably the way to look at it. Fascinating discussion. Um, so this is sadly not unique to this industry, but there's an accountability piece here. So how do we implement accountability in a way that people will see the stake that they have? So I'm not quite sure I understood your question, but I think um, having the open source um, 
and openness of the whole specifications will certainly help. What we don't have in all cases are um, it's yet the infrastructure like you have with the Linux kernel and ways to do upstreaming and so forth. Um, there are, I guess, in some, some projects, but not all, the way that you can have all of the um, source code control and management. It's just not there yet. Yeah, just just on that, I think uh, you do recognize that that is a, that is a good point. Um, some some of the projects are run out of you know Linux Foundation, like like the OpenVMC. Others are are uh, like Tiano Core based, um, and there's others then that are uh, that are run inside an OCP, and there's slightly different governance uh, models ac across those, but. I think the problem with trying to make it one way or one thing is it doesn't work for everybody. There's never one solution that works for everyone. So uh, all, of the pro all of the firmware based projects, um, although we, would su we support many of them from, from open compute, uh, there's no one governance model that we mandate uh, on those projects. Did that answer your question or no? Who's that? Yeah. Um, have you, you talked about measured boot and attestation. Um, have you thought about how, you know, specifically with the TPM, um, how you're going to map out PCRs, for example, on a PC client? Uh, we in TCG, I, I, I'm a member of uh, the Trusted Computing Group, um, created a PCR mapping um, for the more complex systems. Um, have you really thought about how you're going to map, for example, as you take the measurements in the, in the various PCRs, um, standardizing that set of mapping across all of these so verification engines can more easily figure out and, and um, do the verification, which is why we did it in the first place. So have you, have you thought that through at all? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. So, um, obviously with the, with the EDK2, there, that kind of closely aligns with the, um, with, with the TPM model. With the, with the Linux boot, there's fewer boot stages. So it's still the same, you just need fewer P PCRs. Yeah, firmly agree, <laughs> right? Hey, we, we set up eight, oh, well, you know, because you know, uh, EFI is complex. Mm -hmm. um, we think there needs to be fewer for this model. And I was just asking the question, how do you plan on standardizing that smaller set? Uh, work in progress. I'll give you a hint. I'll, ha um, I'll help you with it. Thanks. I, I define the ones for the PC client. Yeah. So I'll be happy to help with that. So I think we've run out of time now. We're at the, the end of the session. So thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. And.